The previous song that we sang together was chosen by my husband, Nick. It was a slow and calming song that reminds us that our souls need to be reminded to stay still because the Lord is on our side. It's really interesting to know the history of a song, and then you appreciate it so much more. And like I said, that was a song that I hadn't sung very often and didn't know much about. The next song that I'm going to sing sort of picks up from the previous song and carries on with a similar theme. I felt like singing the song because I've sung this song so many times before, but I did not know the history behind the song. And now that I do, I've got a new appreciation for this old favorite. You know, when I was introducing and concluding my, I guess, explanation of the song, Be Still My Soul, I noted that the world is still reeling under the effects of this terrible pandemic. The virus has claimed so many lives and it's only natural to be angry, disappointed, frustrated, and definitely heartbroken when you lose a loved one. We can't understand why such things have to be. Of course, we know that it's some sort of illness, possibly cancer or something else apart from the virus may have claimed a loved one, or it could have been as a result of an accident. And yet, we don't understand why that had to happen. The song that I'm singing next, and I hope that you will join me, reminds us that while we may not understand everything now, by and by, we will understand it. This song was written by Charles Albert Tindley. He was born in 1851 and died in 1933. He was an eminent Methodist preacher at the turn of the 20th century. And hymnologist James Abington called Tinley a pastor, an orator, poet, writer, theologian, social activist, father of African-American hymnody, progenitor of African-American gospel music, and the Prince of Preachers. Now, you see, Tindley was born in Worcester country in Maryland, and he was the son of Charles and Esther Tindley. His mother was a free woman, but his father had been a slave. And when his mother died, when he was only two years old, his father raised him. Dr. Abington comments that the biographies often refer to Tindley's slave ancestry, and that is what influenced him in his autobiographical references in his book, Book of Sermons, published in 1932. But the fact remains that Tindley himself was not a slave. You see, economic conditions were difficult when his mother died. And while his father wanted to look after him, it became very difficult to do so. And though his father no longer was a slave, what he did was that circumstances forced him to hire out his young son. The African-American scholar Bernice Johnson Reagan says that the practice was not unusual among the freed blacks. They hired out workers for labored plantations and these were free men who worked alongside people who were still slaves. And they experienced much of the same racism and the reality that the slaves faced on any plantation. The only difference was that they got some remuneration or money. And these hired out workers did get the opportunity to go home, but that's where the difference stopped. Their experience of being treated badly was still very much the same. Now, Tindley moved to Philadelphia as a young man, and he was determined to make something of his life in spite of his difficult experiences as a child and he attended night school. He said, and I quote, I made a rule to learn at least one new thing, a thing I did not know the day before, each day. 
So he was a self-taught young man. He never graduated from college or seminary, and yet he acquired his knowledge from and his understanding by reading more than 8,000 books in his own library that he built up. He took Greek later on through Boston School of Theology and Hebrew through a synagogue in Philadelphia and was awarded two honorary doctorates of divinity from colleges in North Carolina and Maryland. So a far cry from being the child of a slave and a free woman to being a person who was able to establish himself in his own right. Tindley wrote several pieces during his life and he was ultimately given a license to preach in the Bainbridge Street Methodist Church where he was employed as a janitor between 1880 and 1885 and later on he was assigned to the same church as a pastor in 1902. He definitely walked with the Lord every step of the way. He then returned to his congregation as a pastor and was not universally appreciated, though he had served there for many years as a janitor, but he nevertheless held firm in his determination to serve the Lord. Of course, he through his experience was influenced and inspired to write some masterful, gripping, soul-stirring sermons that brought loud amens from the congregation and praise God as he continued during his years of pastoral service. In 1906, he was moved from the Bainbridge Street Church and after some really difficult negotiations was then sent to the Westminster Presbyterian Church. That church seated about 900 people. So it was quite a sea change for him once more, but yet he continued to serve the Lord. As he served, that church grew to a multi-racial congregation of 10,000 people, all because of his efforts to serve the Lord. And after his death, that church was named Tindley Temple. Now, the song, we'll understand it better by and by, was one of eight hymns that he had written during a particular difficult period in his life when negotiations were underway to move him and establish him as the pastor of the Westminster Presbyterian Church on Broad Street. And it reflects aspects of Tinley's ministry through preaching, which aimed to lift the soul and the spirit, especially of African-Americans. Of course, you can imagine Tinley using songs that he had written to punctuate his sermons, offering hope to those who were assembled, not just through focusing on these biblical texts, but also through the very poignant lyrics that he had penned. In fact, African-American scholar Eric Lincoln and Lawrence Mamia clarified that by and by was not simply otherworldly. In fact, these hymns addressed the spirit of those who were oppressed and helped them to survive this world. In the very first stanza, Tindley pictures this restless sea and howling tempests which eventually gives way to the land of perfect day amidst the mists that have rolled away. Stanza two then talks about the economic condition of Tinley's own parishioners when he says, destitute of the things that life demands, want of food and want of shelter, thirsty hills and barren lands. He was talking to his congregation. They could understand and appreciate what he was trying to communicate. In the third stanza, he evokes this image of the promised land found in Exodus and Deuteronomy in the Bible, just as the children of Israel followed the pillar of uh, fire and sm uh, the cloud by day, Tinley exhorts his parishioners, his congregation to follow because the Lord guides his children with his eyes and we need to follow till we die. And finally, the fourth stanza, he focuses on temptations and hidden snares that 
almost grip us when we are most vulnerable and unaware. Possibly he was thinking of Job and we wonder why the test, even when we are trying to do our best, but we will understand it better by and by. That's the refrain. And in fact, we begin with that refrain by and by. And it echoes Psalms chapter 30, verse 5. It says, weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. In the morning, when the Lord has wiped away all tears, when there will be no more suffering, no more tears, no more pain, then we will understand it better by and by. In fact, Tinley's theology is, it's not escapist. It's not a by and by pie in the sky picture. It's based on what the Bible has assured us. It's pure theology of hope that exemplifies what is given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, which says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And so I hope you will sing this beautiful hymn which with me, which reminds us that when the morning comes, we will be gathered home and we'll understand everything better by and by.
I'm sure that Tinley felt every word that he composed. And me, may we rest in the assurance that one day, by and by, the mists will clear and we will see clearly and understand everything in our lives better. By and by, may you be assured by this assurance from the Bible. God bless and take care.